Welcome back to the Britannia Coin Company. We're a coin dealer based in Royal Wootton Bassett in the UK. Today we're going to be looking at a range of coins from the time of the English Civil War. I've had to dust off my memories of primary school lessons about the subject, but I've got some fantastic coins to show you today. We are going to start off before the Civil War breaks out. This coin is a silver hammered 1640 to 1641 Charles I shilling. On the obverse or head side of the coin, you can see the portrait of King Charles I, who is wearing the Tudor crown. The Tudor dynasty had ended with the death of Queen Elizabeth I in 1625, but her successor, King James I of England, or VI of Scotland, the father of Charles I, continued to be portrayed wearing it on coins, as did his son. The crown was broken up and sold in the aftermath of the Civil War. Oh yeah, spoiler alert, the monarchy didn't do particularly well in the aftermath of the Civil War, but more on that later. There is lettering surrounding the king, which in full translates as Charles by grace of God, King of Great Britain, France and Ireland. On the reverse or tail side of the coin, you can see a square topped quartered shield of arms. We have more wording around this coin, which this time translates as I reign under the auspices of Christ. With the English Civil War beginning in 1642, by the time the coin was struck, tensions were already very high between the Crown and Parliament. The reasons for the war are many, and it's a topic I could talk about to you for hours on, but for the sake of time, it boils down to religion, power and money. Although Parliament had slowly built up more powers prior to the Civil War, Charles I believed unwaveringly in the divine right of kings, and had the power to summon and dismiss the Parliament at his own whim, ruling without one for 11 years until war in Scotland forced him to reconvene Parliament to raise funds to continue the war. The summoned Parliament grabbed more power, allowing them to dissolve and reconvene without the King's input. They also had more control with the raising and distribution of taxes. Parliament kept airing their grievances with the King, who tried unsuccessfully to arrest five parliamentarians, and then fearing for his and his family's lives, Charles left London for the north. The divides grew, with cities and towns picking a side, and war commenced. Before we get into the coinage of the war though, I have one more pre-war coin to show you. We roll back the calendar to 1636, prior to Charles's troubles in Scotland, what would eventually become the Bishop's War, a precursor to the Civil War itself, and both these wars then are part of the Greater War of Three Kingdoms. This is a silver hammered Scottish 40 pence. On the obverse we again see Charles I wearing the Tudor crown, surrounded by the text Charles by grace of God, King of Scotland, England, France and Ireland. Some of the detail of the king has been lost to time, but that's to be expected of a coin that is over 380 years old. To the right of his portrait you can see the Roman numerals XL, which denotes the denomination as being 40. If we look at the reverse, we can see an iconic Scottish symbol, a crowned thistle. The thistle has been a national symbol of Scotland since 1249, the beginning of the reign of King Alexander III. In legend it was said that an invading Norse army was sneaking up onto the Scottish army when one Norseman stood on a thistle barefoot and cried out, thus alerting the Scottish army. The crowned thistle first appeared on the coinage of King James V, who ruled from 1513 to 1542 and continued to see use on coins all the way up into the current UK £1 coin, which features the national flowers of all of members of the UK in a crown. The text surrounding this coin translates as the safety of the state is the supreme law. Ironic for Scotland which was three years from the Bishop's War commencing, but also six years from the start of the English Civil War. With peacetime over I have a hammered silver half crown minted in Oxford by royalist supporters to show you now. On the obverse you can see King Charles on horseback wielding a sword. To the right of the mounted monarch is a plume mint mark. Oxford was an important city in the King's War, home to the Royalist Parliament, making it the centre of the Royalist cause. The city would come under siege three times throughout the war and minted coins for the King. Without the tooling and supplies of the Tower Mint in London, which was held by parliamentary forces, there were times where the King's coins were struck on any silver that could be gathered, including the use of silverware. Throughout the war, the King's coinage would be struck at a number of different mints, which makes this time period a fascinating warren of variants and rarities to collect. The text around the coin translates as Charles, by grace of God, King of Britain, France and Ireland. On the reverse you can see three more plumes and the year 1643. 
The text surrounding the coin translates as may God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him, which is an excerpt from Psalms 68. In the middle of the coin, you can see words which translates as the religion of the Protestants, the laws of England, and the liberty of Parliament. This is a shortened version of the declaration made by King Charles in 1642, which was made in Wellington. The use of this declaration of intent by the king on his coins was important, for these coins would end up in the hands of his subjects, and they would be reminded of his declaration to them. And it's almost like Civil War propaganda for the time. Our next wartime coin is a silver hammered threepence, which would have been minted between 1625 and 1649 at the Aberystwyth Mint. At this time, regional mints were popping up all over the country to serve an army and people who were constantly on the move. On the obverse, we see again the Tudor crowned King Charles I, with Roman numerals to the right of him showing this to be a three pence. The text around the coin again translates as Charles by grace of God, King of Great Britain, France and Ireland. There is a bit of a crease in this coin which could have come from being buried and unearthed by a metal detectorist, as some of our hammered coins are. Imagine the excitement of finding one of these in your treasure hunting. On the reverse you can see a shield of arms which is beautifully ornate. This is surrounded by text which translates as being, I reign under the auspices of Christ. The Aberystwyth Mint produced coins for the Royalists from within Aberystwyth Castle until its closure during the Civil War, but was still used to store silver and lead. In 1640, under the direction of Oliver Cromwell, the castle was slighted, a term meaning to damage an important building so to prevent it from being useful going forwards. The ruins did survive and can still be visited. Unlike with the Royalist coins, which would have definitely have been struck for the King, I couldn't get my hands on any wartime parliamentary coins. Interestingly, Parliament continued to strike coins with Charles's name and portrait up to his trial and execution, and we have plenty of examples that could have been minted by Parliament during the war, but without the absolute certainty, I thought it best to be a topic to return to in the future with its own video. I do, however, have this Commonwealth half groat to show you though. This would have been struck between 1649 and 1660 after the Royalists had been defeated and the King had been executed. The Commonwealth refers to the Republic governance of England and Wales and then later Scotland and Ireland after the victory of Parliament in the Civil War. On the reverse you can see the conjoining shields of England with the St George Cross and Ireland which features a harp with the Roman numerals of two above. Now a groat would have been four pence, so this half groat naturally has a value of two pence. On the obverse you can see the shield of England again, bearing a cross of St George. The Commonwealth faced economic hardships and the threat of invasion by Scotland and Ireland, with the armies under the command of one Oliver Cromwell, managed to eliminate these threats by 1653. There were divisions and disagreements with the governance of the newly formed Commonwealth, which were to be utilised by the gentlemen in our next coin. This is a stunning 1658 milled half crown, a milled coin rather than hammered, as it was produced by machinery rather than being hammered by hand. There is so much detail which survives on this coin, which is over 360 years old. On the obverse we see Oliver Cromwell, engraved by Thomas Simon. He looks very Roman with his robe and laureate crown. The wording around the coin translates as Oliver, by grace of God, protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, Ireland, which evokes similarities to that of former monarchs to create continuity. Cromwell was granted the title of Lord Protector of the Commonwealth in 1653 for many reasons, but largely to create a head of state. The title of the Lord Protector gave him greater powers and is the title he retained until his death in 1659, which was then passed to his son, Richard Cromwell. The reverse, again engraved by Thomas Simon, is a crown shield of arms and surrounded by text, this time translating as peace is sought by war. You can see above the crown the date 1658, the shield of arms features two crosses of St George representing England, the harp signifying Ireland, and the cross of St Andrew, or the Saltire, incorporating Scotland. Cromwell's son Richard was removed from his position in 1659 by General George Monk, as at the time the atmosphere between the army and parliament had grown increasingly hostile. Without a figurehead as Charles I had been, and later Oliver Cromwell and his son, although were not kings by name, acted and rules much as a king would, it was time to find a new figurehead for all to rally behind. 
Enter from exile in the Netherlands, King Charles II. This is a silver milled half crown from 1679, bearing the portrait of the son of the executed King Charles I. He was crowned king in 1660, although he had to agree to be lenient and tolerant. He was not to exile former enemies and to grant pardons to nearly all of his opponents, but most importantly, to rule in cooperation with parliament. Being more flexible than his late father, this was agreed and the restoration of the monarchy began. Around the portrait of the king, the wording translates as Charles II by the grace of God. The reverse features crowned cruciform shields around a central garter star with interlinked C's. Above the design, you can see the date 1679. Much like the previous coin, so much of the detail has been preserved on this exquisite piece. The final coin we're going to look at is this enormous silver milled crown, again featuring the portrait of Charles II, surrounding by text, Charles II by grace of God. A mere three years into his reign, the king was eager to rebuild support and respect of his subjects, a part of that we spoke of in Wednesday's video, with the king attending royal Maundy services. So if you missed that video, be sure to go back and check that out. On the reverse, we have a similar design as to the previous half crown, with the text translating again as King of Great Britain, France and Ireland, the same as on the half crown. Charles II would reign as king until his death in 1685 to be succeeded by his younger brother, King James II of England or 7th of Scotland, a monarch who once again caused turmoil to the monarchy, but we've covered a lot of history in today's video already, so we shall save him for another time. Well, that was a lot of history with some beautiful coins to tell the story. A king at war with his own people, deposed and replaced by a king in all but name, to then be replaced 11 years later with the beheaded king's son. I hope you've enjoyed today's video with a look at some of the coinage at the time of the English Civil War. As I said, the coinage of this period is so varied and interesting. I'm sure as new and interesting coins come into the shop, we'll return to this topic in the future. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's free to do. It means you won't miss out on any of our future uploads. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram where you'll see us post lots of images of our products. We're on Twitter and TikTok. There's our shop on online store you can check out. And I'll see you next time for more Raising Coins from the Britannia Coin Company.